over the last 50, 60 years, we've had an increasing number of antibiotics available for treating uh, infections in man and animals. But over those years, there's been a gradual erosion of their effectiveness. One of the scourges of the end of the 20th century is that so many different bacteria have now become resistant, not just to one class of antibiotic, but to multiple classes. And therefore, the race is on to try to get, keep one step ahead of the bacteria. The approach that we've used for almost the past century has involved mechanisms which can be described as putting domestos in a pill so that we kill all known bacteria stone dead. We're reaching a point where, as prescribing doctors, we are increasingly concerned whether we are going to choose the right drug when we're initially faced with our patient. But bacterial communication may hold the key to a completely new kind of therapy. It all started with some research into conventional antibiotics. Something like um, 10 years ago now, I came to, uh, to Nottingham to join the School of Pharmaceutical Sciences. And one of my colleagues, Barry Bycroft, was particularly interested in a group of beta-lactam antibiotics. These are very much like the penicillins. And the reason he was interested in them is because, as a family, they're very potent antibiotics, but they haven't been well developed by the pharmaceutical industry. What we stumbled on was a regulatory mechanism which was used by the organism to express the antibiotics. Can you see the zone of inhibition around oh, yeah. the colony, killing off the E. coli that we've seeded in the plate? Mm -hmm. The antibiotic is called a carbapenem. The bacterium producing it is a winia. We use some standard genetic techniques to make mutants in a winia, which could no longer the produce the, the antibiotic. It. And look what we've got on this plate. We've managed to find six mutants that can't make the antibiotic anymore. Here you can see three that are still making the antibiotic. You can still see the halos. And then we've got one, two, three, four, five, six that can no longer make the antibiotic. When we generated sufficient mutants, we decided the easiest thing to do was to mix different mutants together. The scientists were hoping that some combinations of mutations would cancel each other out. If this happened, it would help them to understand how the antibiotic was made. None of these mutants can make the antibiotic themselves. If you mix them back together, you find the antibiotic is being produced again, you're pretty sure that one of those mutants is making a substance which it's secreting, the other mutant is taking it and using it to produce the completed antibiotic. Identifying such a substance would be the first step towards engineering a new class of antibiotics. The plates would show whether there was any such chemical there. Well, Miguel, come and have a look at this. This is really super. This is really, this has actually worked. Look. All right. We've actually got cross-feeding. Oh, I see. Mutant mm -hmm. 2 is being cross-fed by supernatural from mutant 1. We've got it. Brilliant. Brilliant. That's what we've been looking for. So we spent about six months trying to figure out what this molecule actually was. What they were expecting to find was a molecule resembling an antibiotic. What they actually found was an unrelated molecule called OHHL. It was quite a disappointment. We had to um, agree that, yep, this molecule could not be possibly part of a biosynthetic pathway. It just did not look like a carbapenem at all. And so we had to concede that maybe no BMW in the car park, we wouldn't be getting the huge pharmaceutical industry uh, budget to develop this family. We'd actually gone in the wrong direction. But they still had the molecule. Then we sat back and thought, well, maybe this is really very interesting because the molecule that we had, um, well, was it a known molecule? It was an interesting molecule. So then what we did is to go to the library. And we discovered that my goodness, this compound was a known compound. It was out there. It was known, and it had something to do with deep-sea bioluminescent organisms.
In bioluminescence, this process was already understood. Scientists called it quorum sensing, as it reminded them of boardroom protocol. One particular research group had studied it in detail. Amazingly, they were on the very same campus as Barry and Paul. The leader of the group was Professor Gordon Stewart. In October 1990, there was a meeting of minds. I went up to Gordon. I didn't know him very well at the time. And I said, Professor Stewart, I understand you work on these bioluminescent organisms. How would you um, respond if I were to tell you that we discovered the same signal molecule that switches on and off bioluminescence in marine organisms in a land-loving plant pathogen called Huinia? and it controls carbapenem antibiotic synthesis. What would you say? And I had to pick him up off the floor because this was wonderful, he said. This is marvelous. This is something that has been a holy grail. Gordon and his colleagues had long believed that other bacteria must use quorum sensing. The system was so elegant, they thought, it couldn't be unique. But for the wider scientific community, the idea was a shock. Why it was a surprise is that as experimental scientists, we use microorganisms in a laboratory and we don't necessarily observe them too much in their natural environment. Our interests were in big molecules, macromolecules, proteins, nucleic acids. We didn't really think about the small organic molecules that we were throwing out. And so we've been throwing the baby out with the bathwater essentially for a long time. <laughs>